quote, the final rule clarifies that even a single firearm transaction may be sufficient to require a license, end quote. Now, that is a direct quote from whitehouse.gov website. That's the link that you can find in the description box below that goes through the executive order that will be going into effect on May 10th, 2024. Let me translate what that means. It means that if you sell a single firearm, you could be committing a felony and going to prison. Yes, that's what's going on here. The civilian disarmament enthusiasts are intentionally misleading people with their press releases and their use of statistics. And in this video, I will show you why and with the real statistics. Guys, let's get into it. So really quickly, where did this all come from? Well, back in March of 2023, President Biden signed an executive order directing the attorney general to implement a plan to clarify, that's their words, the definition of who is required to obtain a federal firearms license, the FFL license that you need to be able to sell firearms for profit. Now, this is all thanks to our recent friend, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act of 2022, which followed the Uvalde school shooting. More on that later. Now, one senior White House administration official told reporters that they estimated that the rule would affect roughly 20,000 individuals who they believe are engaged in the unlicensed business of gun sales for profit, which would cover tens of thousands of gun sales each year, they claim. Now, as a note, there's approximately 80,000 registered FFLs in the country at this time. Vice President Kamal Harris told reporters that one in five Americans has a family member who was killed by gun violence. Let me know if you want me to fact check that one, because at a glance, there's just there's just no way that that can be right. Quote, it does not have to be this way. We know how to prevent these tragedies, she went on to say and added, and it's a false choice to suggest you're either in favor of the Second Amendment or you want to take everyone's guns away. Ready for the kicker? This is Vice President Kamala Harris. Quote, I am in favor of the Second Amendment and I am in favor of reasonable gun safety laws. End quote. Okay. I'm going to go to my little Zen place. We're going to take a cut. We'll come back. And I won't stroke out. Let the politicians and the anti-gun control folks know that this is crap. Hit that like button. Also, if you just found us while browsing through, don't forget to hit the subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of our future content. What I'm looking for in the discussion field below is where do you think this is going to go? Do you think that this will actually move the needle by stopping bad guys? Or is this something that, nah, this is just going to wrap up more good guys than bad. Look forward to joining that discussion. Back to the video. So <laughs> what's just one of my many, many, many problems with this? All right, here's just one. It doesn't follow the statistics. Let me show you why. To do this, I'm going to put all the pieces on the chessboard that we're going to start moving them around together. One of them is going to be the 2019 Department of Justice study that examined crime and crime firearms and how do criminals get them. What I found was this. About 43% of criminals purchase their firearm on an underground black market. That is very different than the 0.8% that were alleged to have purchased them at a gun show. 43% underground black market, 0.8% gun show. 6% stole them, 10% apparently used a lawful retail purchase, 11% were straw purchases, and 15% were purchased or borrowed from a friend or relative. Now, if you think, but Tom, what if that 0.8%, what if that was 0.1%, what if that number surging and going up? It's not going down. We have seen a collapse of the firearms coming from gun shows by about 50%. That number has dropped 50% across the last 20 years. So it was about one and a half percent. It's collapsed down to about 0.8%. Statistically, gun shows 
they're not the problem. This was further highlighted by the program chair of the School of Social Sciences, Criminal Justice, and Homeland Security at the Justice Center in Tennessee, Richard Schobel, who basically summarized the sources of so-called crime guns when he said, quote, the majority of the guns used in criminal acts were either stolen or obtained from an underground market on the street. He went on to add that the remainder obtained it from a family member or friend. There's also a rise across the country with theft of guns from vehicles, end quote. So he didn't even mention this so-called gun show loophole that this is being touted as the reason for why it's being pushed. Didn't even come up. And it makes sense why. It's a statistical afterthought. I could keep going on and on with quotes and statistics about all this kind of stuff, but now let's come back to start moving these pieces around. What the White House is doing, what the victim disarmament enthusiasts are doing, is they are merging two different categories that your uncle who's trying to sell guns at the local gun show is going to be regulated and treated in the same category as gangs that are trafficking guns. Doesn't matter if we're talking about rurally, suburbs, urban, doesn't matter what we're talking about, okay? All the same, all going to be regulated the same because we're going to throw that 0.8% for the so-called gun show loophole into the same category as being treated like it's a black market underground trafficked firearm transaction. Why do I think that? Well, first off, <laughs> read their press release and it'll be evidently clear why. Again, a link to the description box below. But more importantly is the fact that they're looking at all these undocumented or unlicensed sellers as people who need licenses. Do you really think a gang in a downtown urban center somewhere is going to go, oh, shoot, we got to apply for an FFL? Probably not. Do you really think that someone bent on destruction, doesn't matter if it's in a rural area, wherever it is, they're going to say, oh, yeah, but regulatory reform and licensing, I got to get on this. If this sort of thinking worked, why don't we just mandate a licensing structure for drug dealers, right? Well, if you're going to sell heroin and methamphetamine, okay, you need to go out there, you need to go to pharmacy school, you need to get all of your licensing lined up, apply with the DEA, and then you can go ahead and do this. Of course not. Who is going to be impacted by this? Because if we want to measure the intent of a law or regulation, look at the effect and then infer, okay? There's times when maybe that's not applicable, but I don't think this is one of those times. Are the underground black markets, are these really going to be impacted? I'm sure in some peripheral way, sure, but not as much as maybe good guys, so to speak. In other words, people who are not out there deliberately selling crime guns to bad guys. They're just out there selling collections, they're out there participating in a hobby. And yes, look, I've got a video with the full breakdown of this executive order. I'm not going to go through that here. Hopefully you'll see it also pop up in the top right-hand corner of the screen right now. My point in all of this is this. I'm not convinced this is going to materially impact the problem. I am convinced that there are going to be good people who get swept up in this. All for what the Justice Department in the White House website in a linked study said went to 368 cases. Now, 368 cases is by no means a small number. But when we're looking at gross crime statistics across metropolitan areas, 368 cases that's what fits on the tip of the pin of a needle when we're talking about the problems out there. This is a massive regulatory step to deal with a very, very small issue as defined by the statistics, not defined by feelings or politics. If you listen to feelings and politics, this is the end of the world. If we look at the actual data, very, very small problem. But let's also not forget where this all comes from. Again, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act of 2022 
following the Uvalde school shooting. What happened at Uvalde? The police stood around and waited as children were killed. They stood around for 77 minutes. Two doors closed and a wall stood between those officers and the evil and sick, twisted 18-year-olds who opened fire on both children and teachers inside of two connected classrooms. Those officers outside had access to a Halligan bar. That's an axe-like device used for forcible entry by firefighters. That was available to them. Officers had access to four ballistic shields inside the school during the standoff with the gunman, according to law enforcement transcript. The first one arrived 58 minutes before officers stormed the classroom. The last of those four arrived 30 minutes before. The officers were also likewise in possession of their own rifles. Some officers were actually itching to move. Now, I look at this and I take among them at least two lessons. First, a failure of law enforcement, of moreover not law enforcement, but of people who were in a position to do something but declined to act for various reasons. Second, a reminder that courts have continuously ruled, or as I say, courts have continuously warned that officers are under zero duty to risk their life to save the life of another. Even though many brave and courageous officers do exactly that all over our country every single day, none have a duty to do so. However, I'm not the only one who took a lesson from this. Apparently, the anti-gun people see the problem here that we have too many victims who are potentially armed in this country, that we need to increase the cost of firearms for people who might be the poorest and most vulnerable, which is exactly what will happen as a secondary, perhaps unintended or intended effect from this. That the police should be the only good guys with a weapon must be their conclusion, despite exhaustive evidence to the contrary about how effective good guys are with guns at defending themselves and deterring crime that I recently covered in another video pinned in the comment field below. And as a result, here we are once again. We're going to use the same broken policies to fix the same clear problem. Our quote of the day comes from Paul Dirac. He's a Nobel Prize winner in physics who is often regarded as being on the same level as Einstein, Newton, and a very short list of others. He said, quote, your knowledge is far more important than your degree, end quote. I wish sometimes there was a lot more knowledge out there and maybe some less degrees. We appreciate you sticking around. I look forward to joining you in the comment section below, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content, and we'll see you in the next one.